Quantum teleportation is a fundamental concept in quantum computing, and it actually introduces a lot of key concepts. Here, I'll cover what quantum teleportation actually is, the steps to teleport quantum information, and actually show you how to write this using OpenCASM, which is quantum assembly language. So make sure to hit the like button and subscribe if you're new here for more content on quantum tech and coding. Quantum teleportation is a critical concept that takes advantage of the powers of quantum mechanics. It's the key behind quantum key distribution and long distance quantum communication, and it's also used in quantum computing. It allows you to teleport, which means actually move a quantum state from one qubit to another. So why do we need something special to copy quantum information? For classical computing, it's pretty easy. We read the bit, the zero or the one, and we copy it to another place. But we actually can't do that in a quantum system. If we read out a quantum state, the superposition and the entanglement is destroyed. And the no cloning theorem says we can't actually copy an unknown quantum state exactly. So we have to do something a little bit different. Quantum teleportation is not actually teleporting or copying information. It means we move the quantum state from one qubit to another. And this actually requires destroying the state of the first qubit, so we're not violating the no cloning theorem. Quantum teleportation has actually been successful in the real world, where we can actually teleport over four miles over fiber optics, and we've done this experiment in multiple locations. We've also done this in space, over 870 miles in the quantum experiments at Space Scale Project. And of course, there's always a relevant XKCD for everything, including quantum teleportation. So first, let's go through the steps of quantum teleportation. Quantum teleportation requires three qubits and two classical bits to complete the protocol. Let's say Alice wants to quantum teleport a qubit to Bob, who is some distance away. So the first step is to prepare the quantum message in the first qubit, Q message. So we prepare the quantum state of this qubit, and it can be any unknown state, which means we can apply any sequence of x, y, and z gates to get any arbitrary state. In our circuit that we're writing here, I'm going to use the U3 gate, which is a rotation gate. So some quantum frameworks call this the rotation gates. U gates, it really depends. But it's a gate that rotates the qubit along any of the three axes in whatever angle that you want. While this is not officially part of the quantum teleportation protocol, we do want to have some interesting state here that we can get out at the end. So let's call this qubit the message qubit, the one with the data that we want to send, and this will be the first qubit in our quantum register. Q message has some unknown quantum state, and that's a state that we actually want to teleport that we created. Now step two is we want to entangle the two other qubits, the qubit that Alice has and the qubit that Bob has. Alice will actually do this, she'll entangle the two qubits and she'll keep one, this is going to be Q Alice, and the other one she's going to send to Bob. When we say particles are entangled, what we really mean is that the states of the two are linked, or they're not separable. That means the state of one qubit can't be described without the state of the other. And this is really a purely quantum phenomena, and it doesn't really exist in the classical world. So it's almost like information is spread across these particles. So then we write that Alice entangles these qubits by applying first a Hadamard gate to Q Alice, and then a Cena gate on Q Alice and Q Bob, with the Q Alice being the control and the Q Bob being the target. The Hadamard gate and the Cena is the protocol to entangle a pair of qubits. The Hadamard gate is a single qubit gate, so it only operates on the one qubit. And what it does is it puts a qubit in a superposition. So it has a half probability of collapsing into the zero state and half probability of collapsing into the one state. The CNOT gate or the controlled NOT gate is a two qubit gate, which means there's a control qubit and a target qubit. This gate performs a NOT gate on the target qubit if and only if the control qubit is in the one state. And a NOT gate is a bit flip, which means that the target qubit was in the zero state and it will then become in the one state and vice versa. So you see here how the states of the qubits depend on each other. And this is how the circuit is going to look like. So now we can send this entangled qubit to Bob, and by send, we mean actually physically transport. And remember, this is important. A lot of people have the misconception that quantum communication is faster than the speed of light, but when you think of us actually sending the qubit, even if it's a photon, it's still going to be limited by the classical channels, or the fiber optics, or the speed of light.
Step four is to do a bell measurement. Now, Alice still has Q message, which is the original message, and she has Q Alice, which is one half of the pair of entangled qubits. Then we perform the bell measurement on these two qubits that we have, which is a quantum mechanical measurement that actually determines which of the four bell states these two qubits are in. Then we apply a C naught gate, and that's applied to the qubits Q message and Q Alice, and then a Hadamard gate on Q message. This C naught unentangles these two qubits. This takes our quantum information and translates it back to classical information. That's what a bell measurement is. So when Alice measures our qubits, there's gonna be four possible combinations. She's gonna get 00, 01, 10, or 11. Those are the bell states. Alice sends this information to Bob as well, and that's transferred over those two classical qubits that I talked about. The result from the Q message is the first bit, and the result from Q Alice is the second bit. And again, this is why it's not faster than the speed of light. Of course, when you measure two entangled states, we always say that they collapse, right? But we don't know how to interpret the measurement and their correlations until we get this classical information from Alice. And it doesn't matter if she actually sends that data or calls Bob or anything, it's still limited because we need that classical information in the next steps. So the next step is to recreate the quantum state. After the measurement, depending on what Bob receives, he does some operations to his qubit. If the first qubit that Bob receives is a 1, then he applies a Z gate. If the second qubit he receives is a 1, he applies an X gate. Which means if Alice transmits 0, 0, Bob does nothing to his qubit. If she transmits 0, 1, he only applies the X gate. If she transmits 1, 0, he only applies the Z gate, and applies both gates if she sends 1, 1. And now Bob has a qubit with the original state that Alice's qubit had. Congratulations, you've now teleported an unknown quantum state. But why does this actually work? This works because the state of Alice's qubit and Bob's qubit actually depend on each other. Let's look at the full circuit here. Q0 is the Q message with the unknown quantum state, Q1 is Q Alice, and Q2 is Q Bob. The classical information we receive from Alice tells Bob how the state of his qubit actually differs from Alice's, and that tells us what gates we need to apply to to get back to the original state. Really, the key to understanding the circuit is EPR pairs. The EPR pair is a key concept in quantum computing, and it tells us how measurements are correlated. The correlation between these pairs means that the results will always be equal. If one is a zero, the other is zero. If one is a one, the other is also a one. However, the key here is, and why it's confusing and why we have to apply gates, is that they have to be in the same basis. A basis state is just the components of how we can measure any state in the system using these two components. So you can create any combination of these two to get to any point in the vector space. So if we have these two vectors, that's one basis set. These are just different vectors that are transformed by the Hadamard gate, but we can still actually use them to describe where a state is in the vector space, just in slightly different terms. That's what Alice's classical information send actually tells us. It tells us how we need to change our basis state to get back to the one where they're perfectly correlated. We need to make sure that this Q Bob gets back into the right basis state and then they're perfectly correlated, which means that Q message and Q Bob are going to be the same. The first two qubits, the Q message and Q Alice, are now discarded. So this does not violate no cloning theorem because the Q message state has now collapsed and we've transferred that unknown quantum state into Q Bob. Now go ahead and do it yourself. Try it using OpenCASM, you can do this in Q Sharp, you can do this in CERC, and any of the quantum computing framework languages. So I hope you enjoyed this quick tutorial on quantum teleportation, and if you did, please like this video, it actually helps me a lot. And let me know what other tutorials you'd like to see, and subscribe for more videos on quantum and tech and coding. Sharp yourself.